Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this week's um, One World Combinatorics on Words seminar. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Luke Schaefer from the University of Waterloo, and he's going to talk to us about summation and transduction in automatic sequences. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, so uh, this is on summation and transduction. And uh, the motivation for this talk was, uh, oops, <clears throat> was based in large part on Wallet. So uh, if you haven't heard of Wallet before, it's the software package created by Jeffrey Shallot and his students over the years. And uh, it decides first order statements about K automatic sequences. So um, if you can write a question about a, an automatic sequence in this formal first order logic way and feed it into the, uh, the software, it will confirm or refute the conjecture uh, often quite quickly, like seconds or minutes. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, one of the problems with Walnut is that it's limited to first order logic. Uh, so there are certain things that we'd like to talk about that are, are difficult to state in that kind of language. Like, say you have a factor of a, an automatic sequence, like W here, um, and uh, you want to look at uh, the number of occurrences of some symbol in W, or talk about the sum of all the symbols in W, or compare W against some uh, regular language. Uh, those are all kind of um, holistic uh, questions about your factor. Um, and first order logic struggles to express that kind of thing. Uh, second order logic, it's fine. First order, uh, it's not clear how to represent any of the, these things. But um, we're not going to give up because these are interesting things that we'd like to look at, these counts and sums and uh, transduce sequences and things. Uh, so the idea of this talk was to survey some of the uh, results that you can use when you want to talk about one of these things, and ideally you can prove stuff mechanically, um, but, uh, you know, first order logic is, is getting in their way. So uh, we'll see if that works out. Uh, I've got a kind of a collection of older results, um, and uh, at the end I'll, I'll get into some some new stuff um, on the paper folding sequences, but uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So <clears throat> um, to start, I want to talk about summation, and we'll need an example sequence. So the running example for this talk will be uh, period doubling, right? This infinite binary sequence here, uh, it's the fixed point under uh, of this morphism H, okay? Uh, which makes it, I guess, pure morphic and too automatic. Um, I think that's about all you need to know about period doubling. It's going to be our example. And what we want to do with it is uh, sum up parts of the sequence. Uh, in the introduction, I said factors, but you can observe that uh, the sum of a factor is the difference of two prefix sums. So it suffices to look at a, a sum of uh, prefixes of this sequence. So we define this partial sum sequence where the nth term is the sum of the first n bits in uh, period doubler. Okay, so uh, wh what is this sequence? Uh, the first thing you should note is that it's not bounded. So it's not going to be automatic or morphic or anything like that. Uh, we're going to need some other characterization of sequences. And so we're going to have to introduce k-synchronized and k-regular sequences. And I'll talk about those as they come up. But uh, actually, our, our first result is going to be the uh, statement that every k-automatic sequence has k-regular partial sums. Uh, this is well known, but we're going to walk through it just uh, sort of um, uh, as a warm-up. Um, but OK, I, I need to define what k-regular is. And uh, there's several definitions. Uh, but the one I'm going to use for this talk is that if you have a an integer sequence, it's k regular if you can find uh, m or k matrices, so one matrix for each uh, digit of your base k representation, and these should be square integer matrices. 
uh, as well as two vectors, u and v. And then the idea is that you can uh, compute an element of the sequence uh, in the following admittedly convoluted way, where you uh, you take your integer n and express it in base k. That gives you a collection of digits. And then you map each of those digits to the corresponding matrix. Then uh, you multiply those matrices together in the order that they occur. And uh, on either side, you multiply by u transpose and v to get an integer. So this is a, a k regular sequence. And uh, this is really the right notion for talking about um, all sorts of integer sequences related to k automatic sequences. Um, and sort of, uh, yeah, clearly the right thing to do um, from experience, but sort of harder to justify uh, straight from the definition. So, okay, our, our goal is to prove this theorem from the last slide, that if you start with a k-automatic sequence, you get a k-regular sequence of partial sums. And to do that, I want to start by talking about just prefixes in general of k-automatic sequences. Like take the first 23 symbols in period doubling. Um, because it's a morphic sequence, we know we can factor it. So a, a large part of that prefix is the image of an earlier prefix followed by, in this case, the digit one. And you can factor that earlier prefix and keep factoring recursively and get a, a decomposition of this form where we alternate between uh, applying the morphism H and appending some short string. Um, in this case, either the empty string or one, but it, it could be uh, any short string. Um, so as a, a decomposition of prefixes, this is a, a pretty good way to do things. But um, if you're trying to build up a prefix from nothing, it's not obvious which symbols you want to append, right? Um, you can tell how many symbols you're supposed to append based on the, the digits of your representation, but it's not so clear um, which symbols you want to add to the end after you've applied your, your morphism. And uh, ideally, we'd like to remove this appending step entirely and get a, a purely morphic description of prefixes. So I'm imagining something like this, where uh, say we have the prefix of length 2n, or length n, we can get to the prefix of length 2n by one morphism, and 2n plus 1 by a different morphism. Now, as drawn, this can't possibly work. There aren't uh, morphisms h0 and h1 which accomplish this, uh, but if we make one small change for this, and uh, for every uh, prefix here, we add a, a an extra symbol representing a, a preview of the next symbol in the, the sequence, um, then this is possible. So uh, yeah, what we've done here is just add this um, new symbol. Uh, this is over a, a separate copy of the alphabet, which I've made purple. And I'm claiming that now H0 and H1 exist. And in fact, you can write them out. And uh, well, okay. Uh, what are these morphisms doing? Well, you can see that on the original um, alphabet, H0 and H1 both perform H, okay? They just expand the original symbol in the ordinary way, or original alphabet in the ordinary way. Uh, and uh, on the purple copy of the alphabet, they um, also uh, apply H as normal, but then they may truncate uh, the string. So H0 truncates it to length one, and then they make the last symbol purple because uh, we're trying to preserve this property that if the prefix ends with a purple symbol, it will continue to end with a purple symbol. Um, so this construction can be carried out for any k-automatic sequence. And the point of it is that if we want to compute, say, uh, the prefix of length 23 again, uh, it suffices to work out the binary representation of 23, these digits 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then apply those morphisms to the empty prefix. And this will build up the prefix that we're interested in. So uh, if we apply these morphisms, uh, we find that we get exactly the prefix of length 23 plus this preview of the next symbol. 
So this is a nice clean morphic way of representing prefixes in the period doubling sequence. And I'm claiming that it generalizes to any K automatic sequence. All right, so uh, the other part of this proof is going to be preq vectors. Um, so the preq vector is a vector naturally that counts the number of occurrences of each uh, alphabet symbol in your word. So the preq vector of banana, for example, uh, there are three A's, a B, and two N's. So you have three, one, two. Um, if you were working over a larger alphabet, uh, say the rest of the um, uh, Latin characters, then you would get zeros for all the characters that do not occur in banana. Um, anyway, uh, for our purposes, the preq vector is interesting for two reasons. First, uh, if you want to compute a sum, it's easy to reduce it to computing a preq vector, right? If you know how many times each symbol in your alphabet occurs and you know the value of each symbol, uh, it's straightforward to calculate the sum. In fact, I want to observe that it's exactly a uh, inner product of some constant vector with the preq vector. Okay, uh, so that's going to be handy for computing sums. Uh, the other property that we want is a commuting diagram. So uh, the preq vector will commute with our H0 um, and H1 morphisms in the following way. And let me uh, do this on an example. So if we start with a, a prefix of the string, we could apply H0 uh, and then the preq vector or preq map um, to get a vector. Uh, but we could equally apply the preq vector first. And uh, what I'm claiming is that there exists a matrix that goes from the vector on the left to the vector on the right, or in general, um, makes this diagram commute, no matter what the original input was. So uh, for every H0 at the top there, there exists some matrix at the bottom that uh, lets us sort of rearrange where we're applying uh, psi, this uh, preq map. So we can do this for H1 as well. And we get slightly different vectors and uh, strings on the right, and also a slightly different matrix, but the same principle holds. And at this point, we're almost done uh, because we want to compute a sum. Uh, we argued that it's uh, an inner product of the preq vector uh, with a constant vector. So uh, we have that much. And then we know how to decompose this prefix uh, in terms of a composition of morphisms, right? Based on the, the binary uh, representation of N. So something like this. So then we have phi and H1 next to each other. And our commuting diagram lets us uh, exchange them. So H1 becomes a matrix. Phi gets put, or psi gets pushed a little closer to the right. And uh, we can keep doing this all the way, way to the end where uh, psi gets applied to uh, the empty prefix, um, plus this purple preview of the next symbol, which is a, a one, it turns out. So let's call that uh, final vector V. And we've essentially <clears throat> written an arbitrary uh, prefix sum in exactly the form that we wanted for our K regular sequence, right? Uh, product of matrices corresponding to the bits of the length of the sequence. Um, actually, I think it might be backwards. Uh, we might have got the bits in reverse order, but there's a, a simple trick to deal with that. You just um, take the transpose of all the matrices and exchange the vectors or something like that. So, okay, uh, that's the theorem. Um, proof by example, I guess. Uh, every K automatic sequence has these K regular partial sums. Now, unfortunately, a, a K regular sequence is not something we can use directly in Walnut. Um, if you're trying to prove things mechanically, it's actually not very helpful. It's good for getting some understanding of the sequence and for uh, computing specific terms of it quickly, but uh, in terms of mechanical proof, it's actually not much help. So what can we do? Well, we need some further trick. 
Like for example, uh, if we only need the partial sums mod m, there's a theorem that says you can reduce uh, a regular sequence, k regular sequence mod m, and it becomes k automatic. Uh, the principle is really just that when you have these integer matrices vectors and, and integers all mod m, they become finite sets and things are, well, finite state, finite output, and you can get a k automatic sequence. So for example, uh, if we turn to our period doubling uh, sequence, the partial sums of this mod two uh, should be a two automatic sequence because the partial sums are too regular and we're reducing. And in fact, they should be a, a two automatic sequence you recognize because this is 2A Morse. Uh, so there's a result that 2A Morse is equal to this partial sum mod two. Although I should say, if your goal was just to prove this fact in Walnut, you'd be better served uh, constructing the first differences of 2A Morse and comparing them with uh, period doubling rather than building this uh, partial sum sequence. Um, same result, but slightly easier to do in Walnut. Okay, uh, another trick uh, that you can try to use is um, if a sequence is k-regular but only takes on finitely many values, then you can show it must be k-automatic. And uh, it's rare for the partial sums of a sequence to be to take on finitely many values, but sometimes we can help the process along. So take this uh, infinite morphic word. I don't think it has a name. I just made it up. Uh, but if you plot the partial sums, you can see they're basically a straight line. Uh, they're very close to the line of slope two-thirds. Um, so what if we could subtract off two-thirds n, like subtract off this line? Then what would we have? Well, uh, sorry, the, uh, the easiest way to subtract off the line is to just subtract two-thirds from every single symbol in the sequence. Right? And if you're summing n of them, that subtracts two-thirds n. And so literally, we're going to apply a, a coding which takes zero to minus two-thirds and one to plus a third. Except I don't want to have to deal with fractions. You don't want to deal with fractions. So let's, uh, let's do minus two and plus one instead. And when you do this, you apply this coding and look at the partial sums. You get a nice uh, finite set. It appears to be between minus two and two uh, on the entire sequence. Uh, so uh, easy result then, this new bounded sequence uh, must be three automatic. And uh, I suppose that's great um, because if, if you're interested in these partial sums, uh, Walnut can then prove anything you like about them because it, it's very good at manipulating these automatic sequences. Uh, but what if you were interested in the original set of partial sums? What are you supposed to do there? Well, um, there's this notion of a, a k-synchronized sequence, which I hinted at earlier. Uh, a function from integers, or let's say natural numbers to natural numbers, is k-synchronized if there's an automaton accepting its graph. So all pairs x and f of x represented in, in base k. Um, and I claim that such a thing exists for this uh, partial sum sequence that we were talking about, because um, concretely, I claim it suffices to check that check whether uh, given a, an, an index and a variable s for the sum, whether s equal well, whether this equation holds, uh, whether the automatic sequence R is equal to 3s minus 2n. And all of those bits are things that Walnut can do. So it's no problem constructing this automaton. And the reason we want this equation is because on the previous slide, we showed that rn is equal to this partial sum minus 2n. So uh, in case synchronized sequences, we just have to verify given the answer that it's correct. And I'm claiming we can do that here. Once you have a k-synchronized sequence, um, your partial sum is basically a, a first-class citizen in Walnut. You can um, apply the, the function to variables. You can apply it to itself. You can look at the inverse. 
Uh, you can find fixed points. Anything you'd hope to do with the sequence becomes uh, reasonable once it's case synchronized. Um, but you can't always get a case synchronized sequence. So it will take period doubling. Uh, it also has partial sums that are very close to this line of slope two thirds. And we could imagine applying the same trick to subtract off the line. Uh, but the partial sums here are uh, not clearly bounded. In fact, you can show that they grow logarithmically with n. And so uh, we can't use the same trick to argue that uh, the partial sums of period doubling are, are case synchronized. And actually, uh, I claim that they're not case synchronized at all. Um, because uh, the partial sums of the original sequence and the uh, coded sequence are um, related. One is too synchronized if the other is too synchronized and uh, vice versa. And there's this result that a uh, k-synchronized sequence that's sublinear must be constant. Uh, you can get this by playing around with um, the automaton for it, the, the pumping lemma to get a contradiction. And so the coded sequence uh, was sublinear. It was growing logarithmically uh, which is faster than constant. Therefore, it can't be too synchronized and neither can the original partial sums. Okay, so uh, that's a bit disappointing. There exist these sequences where um, things are not synchronized. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. That's sort of what's known about this question. Um, I'll just add one more result. Uh, a recent theorem with um, Jeff and a, a student says that uh, if you want to look at BD sequences, uh, so the floor of alpha n plus beta for irrationals alpha and beta, actually, I don't even think they need to be irrationals, uh, but the base that we're working in is uh, a quadratic irrational gamma, and they're in this field of Q adjoining gamma. Um, anyway, uh, this sequence is uh, synchronized, not case synchronized, but over a appropriate Ostrowski numeration system. Um, and this is in some sense summation because uh, the BD sequences are partial sums of the Sturmian sequences, which are very important in common networks and words. And so this result tells you that you can uh, compute various things about um, their partial sums. All right, so that's about what I wanted to say on summation. Now we're going to move to uh, oh yeah, uh, now we're going to move to transduction. So here we're talking about applying finite automata to parts of an automatic sequence. Um, so the the main theorem, in fact, is going to be that we have a uh, an automatic sequence W and a, a DFAO. Uh, so uh, a DFA, but instead of this states being labeled either accept or reject, they can have more general labels from any finite set you want. Okay, and then you apply this DFAO to larger and larger prefixes of a, your k-automatic sequence, and the claim is that the resulting sequence is itself k-automatic. Okay. A uh, simple example would be uh, this DFAO, for example, which uh, computes parity. Um, you run it on a bit string, and the, the final state that it's in represents the parity of that bit string. And uh, if we use this as the DFAO in the, the above theorem, what we're essentially saying is that the partial sums mod 2 are k-automatic, which is a result we already showed in the, the previous section. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to, to show is that this result uh, sort of generalizes in a different direction than summation, right? We can talk about any regular language uh, recognized by the FAO or um, partial sums or various other things. Okay, uh, so this theorem um, is, is known. Uh, not quite in this form. Uh, Decking proved a result in the, the 90s where um, it's a bit of an odd statement, but he showed that uh, if you have a k-automatic sequence of 
uh, functions from the finite set to itself, then you can look at compositions of those functions on larger and larger prefixes, and the result will be k-automatic. And this sort of implies the previous result um, with a little bit of work because, well, in any uh, finite automaton, you have these functions from a set to itself. They're the transition functions of each alphabet symbol, right? And composing all of these transition functions is really the, the meat of the work that uh, a DFA does. So uh, this result can be used to prove the previous one. And sorry to be confusing, but we're going to prove yet a third version of this theorem, uh, which is more algebraic. It works with uh, morphisms. So uh, you have a, a monoid and a homomorphism uh, to that monoid. Uh, from the alphabet of your automatic sequence into the monoid. And then you apply this monoid to, or morphism to larger and larger prefixes of your sequence. And the claim is that the result is k-automatic. And again, there are reductions and connections to the previous results. Like uh, uh, this set of functions under composition is a finite monoid. So Decking's version is in some sense a special case of this. And just to complete the circle, uh, you can observe that computing a monoid homomorphism like this is something you can do with finite state. Like there's a, a DFAO that will do it. So uh, this version of the theorem can be solved by the original one. So all three of these things are the same. And this is the one that we're going to look at today. Okay, uh, let's get started uh, trying to prove this. And uh, we'll do that by looking at a, a typical term, which is just um, this phi, this monoid homomorphism applied to a prefix. And we're going to expand the prefixes the same way we did in uh, the previous section with this uh, sort of composition of morphisms. And you notice in this diagram that towards the beginning, uh, H1 is applied to something, and then phi is applied to the result. And if we look at the composition of those, uh, we get some phi prime, uh, another um, object of the same type as phi, in the sense that it's a, a homomorphism from sigma star to M. Okay? And you could construct this thing no matter what psi and H1 you have, as long as they're moving between the appropriate sets and the morphisms. Um, so let's write it as a function of those two objects, say delta of phi and h1. And actually, in the position of h1, we're only ever going to be using either h0 or h1. So let's just abbreviate it as a, a 1 or a 0 and drop the h part. OK? So uh, we have this delta function that lets us simplify these compositions. And we'll apply it on our, our term so uh, that phi and h1 at the beginning get replaced with a, a delta phi comma 1, and that's applied to the rest of the expression. Uh, but then that delta function and the next h1 uh, can be reduced in the same way, right? Uh, we get delta of our earlier delta function comma 1. So they're starting to nest. And if we keep going, uh, the nesting gets even worse. So I don't know about you, but this looks to me exactly like a uh, finite automaton, right? We can even abbreviate it the way you would normally would for a uh, uh, finite automaton transition function. Uh, the only thing we really need to check here, uh, be careful about, is that we're working on a set of finite states. Um, and well, if you examine the transition function delta that we've constructed, uh, the set of states is the set of monoid homomorphisms from sigma star to n. And, uh, well, okay, uh, that could be infinite. Sigma star is certainly infinite. Uh, but the nice thing about these homomorphisms is that it suffices to specify them on the, the generators. Uh, so sigma, right? Uh, if you look at a homomorphism on long strings, or any string longer than uh, one, uh, it's determined by composition, right? You uh, multiply what the homomorphism does on the individual symbols. And on the empty string, it has to be mapped to one, because that's a condition of monoid homomorphisms. 
So it really suffices to see what this homomorphism does on sigma. Uh, it's, in other words, equivalent to a, a function from sigma to m. And both of those objects are finite. Sigma is a finite alphabet. Um, I guess it's uh, the alphabet of the, the automatic sequence. And m is assumed to be a finite monoid. So the composition of these two things is a or the functions between these two things are a finite set, and we have a finite automaton. Although, just to be sure, uh, let me walk through all the data that we're supposed to have. Uh, our input alphabet here is 0 and 1, but in general it would be uh, digits base k. Uh, our alphabet output alphabet is m, because the whole goal of this was to output a, an element to this monoid. Uh, we just talked about the state set extensively. It's finite, so we're good. Uh, we constructed this transition function. And then uh, we also need an initial state. And the natural choice there is just the original homomorphism that we started with. And an output map. Like when we reduce all of it way to the end and there's no morphisms to consume, we have a, a state Q and we have to convert it to a monoid end. If you jump back a second, uh, what we were doing is applying it to um, uh, the empty prefix with this purple preview of the, the first symbol. So we'll just uh, apply it to take our final state and apply it to that, uh, that spring. And the result is uh, we have this finite automaton and it takes uh, a base two representation of a number and com computes the uh, transduced input. So uh, we recover this theorem. And uh, <clears throat> so this has been known for a while. Um, as I said, it, it was a consequence of uh, uh, Decking's theorem. Uh, but recently, as of uh, March last year, uh, this functionality has actually been added to the wallet. So it's no longer theory, you can get Walnut to help you do this transformation uh, rather than you know calculating all of this yourself. Um, so even though it's not uh, something you can state in first order logic, you can have Walnut transduce these automata and then use them as you would any other automatic sequence in, uh, in your predicates. Okay, um, so then the last section, I want to build on this transduction result and argue something new. Um, so uh, <clears throat> our proof and Decking's proof are a little bit different. And uh, the one advantage that our proof has is that for much of it, uh, this H0 and H1 morphism, those are completely arbitrary. Uh, they don't need to be about prefixes of a sequence or uh, they don't need to be uniform, really no assumptions on them at all. Uh, in other words, we can sort of factor out this lemma, where if you want to compute phi applied to some composition of morphisms, and it doesn't really matter what they are, uh, there's a DFAO that will do that. You just input the list of morphisms that you want to apply, and it outputs an expression of this form, okay? And I guess there's a, uh, some complicated details of all the, the pieces in this slide, but the core of it is that we can apply or compute an expression like this uh, with a DFAO. And one of the consequences of this, of this is that we can um, generalize uh, the transduction result from prefixes to factors. Uh, so I believe Jason Bell had a version of this back in 2013, but I think it's lost. And uh, I had a version that appeared in my thesis. Uh, basically, the result is what I uh, said. If you uh, have this k-automatic sequence, you can construct a, a 2D sequence where you feed in um, an index and a length, and it will tell you the, the transduce, transduced result of that factor of your, your automatic sequence, the factor starting at i of length n. Uh, but this is not the new thing that I wanted to show you. As I said, it's um, from at least 2013. Uh, instead, I wanted to show you a result on the paper folding sequences. Um, so the paper folding sequences, again, you may have seen these before. Uh, 
but they're what happened when you take a long strip of paper and you fold it in half and a half again and then half again, and then unfold and look at the pattern of creases, right? So uh, here you can see quite clearly that the first two creases are what are called mountain creases. And then uh, the third one, I'm going from the left, sorry, is a, a valley crease. Um, basically the creases in the picture correspond to this sequence at the bottom. And uh, you can also uh, generate an infinite paper folding word. If you keep doing this process with more and more uh, folds, you'll get longer and longer paper folding sequences, which will converge to this infinite regular paper folding word. And there's various ways to define it. Um, one way is uh, this interleaving process, which I think makes it a, a topless word. Um, but uh, it's also too automatic. Okay, but uh, I don't want to talk about just one paper folding sequence. I want to talk about the whole family of them, uh, because every time you fold, or actually it's uh, in some ways better to look at when you unfold, uh, you're making a choice between whether that fold should be a, a mountain or a valley. And for example, the first unfold that you make uh, fixes your word to be either of the form um, well, one of these two forms, basically. Uh, depending on whether it's a mountain, uh, that'll be the first um, fold you see, or a, a valley. And with some difficulty, you can translate this uh, framework of, of these choices into morphisms. So what I mean is that there are morphisms uh, H mountain and H valley. And these operate over some uh, internal intermediate alphabet, S, A, B, C, D, um, such that uh, you can apply these morphisms uh, to generate um, finite paper folding sequences. So if you make the choice to unfold uh, as a, a mountain and then a valley and then another mountain, you can take the composition of the corresponding morphisms uh, then apply this final coding tau to get uh, the sequence. Uh, I guess one thing I should uh, point out here, there's a, a starting symbol, um, the square, which is neither a, a mountain nor valley crease, just because in paper folding sequences, uh, they're sort of annoyingly, um, you get two to the k minus one creases, okay, just one short of the power of two. And so things are, are much tidier if we add one symbol at the beginning. Okay, so um, yeah, with this sort of uh, pair of morphisms, uh, we can construct finite paper folding words. Like uh, if we choose three mountain folds, we get this specific paper folding word when you work through all the details. And that's the one we saw on the first slide. Um, the, the picture of the actual sheet of paper. But there are, of course, uh, seven other choices that you could make. And they yield different, but sort of similar looking paper folding words. And then you can extend this uh, as well to infinite words. If you have an infinite sequence of instructions for how to unfold your word, uh, you get an infinite paper folding word, okay? Um, for example, the original regular paper folding word uh, it's the one you get from instructions uh, where you always take the mountain fold. Um, but there's a whole uncountably infinite family of these paper folding words. And uh, I guess one more thing I want to point out is that you remember our prefix construction that lets us look at prefixes of automatic sequences in a sort of clean way. You can do exactly the same thing to these paper folding morphisms. So the result is uh, a collection of four matrices or four morphisms. They're all combinations of uh, do I want to apply mountain or, or valley folds and all combinations of zero or one. Um, so this collection of morphisms uh, over this sort of doubled alphabet will let you construct any prefix of any paper folding word. And so, for example, you can get an automaton that takes a sequence of instructions and a sequence of digits and tells you uh, the value of the sequence at a particular 
the corresponding paper folding sequence at the corresponding position. Um, but we can also combine it with this transduction result, and uh, in particular, the, the lemma we came up with, and uh, get a result where we can also transduce an appropriate uh, prefix of a particular paper folding word. So um, for any DFAOT, you can construct the DFAO that uh, computes this transduced version. So there's a in effect, a way to transduce over all paper folding words at once. So where do I want to go with this? Well, uh, last Christmas, there was a beautiful talk in the seminar series called All I Want for Christmas is an Algorithm to Detect a Sturmian Word Accepted by an Omega Automaton. Uh, and this was by Pierre. Go back and watch that talk sometime. It's, it's great. Uh, and it's a very simple question. Uh, the Omega Tomaton gives you an infinite uh, set of, the Omega Tomaton gives you a collection of infinite words, and the Sturmian words are another collection of infinite words, and you just want to know if these two sets intersect, right? And if they do, maybe uh, pull out an example Sturmian sequence that's accepted by the Omega. And uh, I won't do this for Sturmian words, uh, but could you do this for paper folding words, right? We've built up all this theory that lets you transduce over paper folding words, and we put it to use and get a similar sort of algorithm for them. And, uh, well, we need to start proving this result. And I say proof very loosely. This is going to be the sketchiest part of the talk. Um, we need to start with some theory about omega automata, because there are many different kinds they're all supposed to recognize the omega regular languages, uh, but we're going to focus on the last one, on Muller automata, uh, because they have the advantage that uh, you apply a deterministic automaton to your word, and then you decide whether to accept or not based on the set of recurrent states. Okay, so you have to keep track of what the state is at every position uh, along this word, and uh, that sounds to me a lot like a transductor. So uh, we'll get into the details then. Um, let's fix a state that we want to know if it's recurrent, okay? And then uh, uh, the state is recurrent as long as it occurs in every suffix of this term, okay? After any position y for arbitrary y. And uh, we can actually say, okay, it occurs at position x, which occurs after y, and uh, if we quantify over x and y appropriately, then we can express this property being recurrent. Uh, and the inner part of this uh, question, is the state q at position x? Uh, we already have an automaton for that. This is this uh, idea of transducing over paper folding sequences. So there exists a DFA which will tell us given a, a paper folding sequence and a, an integer, what the state of the automaton is after that reading that prefix. Um, and we can change it so that uh, it it's a DFA that accepts if the state is Q. Okay, so make it specific to the state Q. And then the other part of this condition that X needs to be greater than Y, well, it's easy enough in Walnut to add a, another variable for y and check whether x is less than or equal to y. They're just base two integers, so this is easily doable. Um, and then all we need to do is quantify over this DFA uh, for all y there exists an x. Uh, but I should caution that um, it's, it's difficult to do this. Uh, in particular, you need to convert this DFA to an omega automaton before you quantify. Um, because uh, when we quantify over integers in automata like this, uh, we're actually quantifying over strings. And uh, so Walnut, for example, the way it works is you have these um, integer registers, and when you quantify over one, it quantifies over the strings and has some tricks to fix things up at the end. And that works for integers, but when one of the uh, inputs is a, a sequence of instruction, like it is here, uh, it's a lot less clear that you could do that. 
So if we simply convert to an omega automaton and then do the quantification, which is still possible, uh, omega regular languages have all the necessary closure properties to quantify over these two variables, uh, then we get our result. Or, or rather, uh, we get a omega regular language representing all paper folding instructions for which state Q is recurrent. Um, okay, just to wrap up then, um, if you want a particular set of states to be recurrent, you can construct it as a sort of Boolean combination of these uh, recurrent languages for individual um, states. And then the acceptance condition is a, a union over which sets of uh, recurrent states are acceptable. Um, so we can construct at the end of this an omega automaton that accepts all uh, paper folding instructions which cause the uh, omega automaton, original omega automaton to accept. And the result then is, I'm not going to call this a theorem because this proof was very sketchy, but we have an algorithm for detecting a paper folding word in an omega regular language. Okay, so uh, that's the final result. I'll just uh, quickly recap uh, the contents of this uh, talk. So we started with a bunch of uh, results on summing sequences. Um, so they have k -reg regular partial sums, uh, which isn't very useful, but uh, there are various ways to get k-automatic or k-synchronized sums, like reducing mod m, or uh, if you can show the sequence has finitely many values, or you can help it have finitely many values. And if you're sort of linearly related to something k-automatic, you can uh, construct a k-synchronized sequence. However, not all uh, partial sums will be k-synchronized. Um, sometimes you're just stuck. And then there's a special case of the BD sequences, which uh, we have a ad hoc argument to show are synchronized, at least for quadratic irrationals or things you can build out of quadratic irrationals. Um, then we moved on to this transduction result and showed that k-automatic sequences transduce to k-automatic sequences. And uh, we had sort of three equivalent versions of this result, one of them proved by Decking in the 90s, uh, but we gave a, a separate proof of this monoid version. And uh, then we noted that our, our uh, result uh, can extend beyond prefixes. Um, so you can use it to transduce on the factors of a k-automatic sequence. Or uh, we had this elaborate example with the paper folding sequences. And in general, it would be for things like s attic sequences. So uh, I guess that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, so I was wondering, um, do these trans Deduction results work for Fibonacci automatic sequences? Yeah, they should. Um, so I think there's a trick where, um, say your morphism isn't uh, uniform, right? Which Fibonacci is not. Uh, you can sort of pad out all the entries of it like in, invent a new symbol, a, a blank symbol, and pad out all of the entries with the blanks. Uh, so then you have something K uniform and, and have, a, have it map the blank symbol to another collection of blanks of the same length. So now you've made a, a K automatic sequence, which is the original sequence interspersed with a whole bunch of blank symbols. But if you have a transducer, you can arrange for it to ignore those blank symbols, like just do nothing. And then I think you should be able to collapse that back to uh, just the Fibonacci sequence when you're, or uh, a Fibonacci automatic uh, result when you're done. But uh, there's some details to work out. It, it should be fine. Okay. Um, yeah, does anyone um, have anything else? Uh, if not, um, 
Yeah, thank you so much, Luke.